This video is brought to you by BoardGamePrices.com. Find the best prices for board games at BoardGamePrices.com. Kia ora and welcome to the rare view on Arkham Horror. This is a new and very irregular video segment that I'll be doing about games that are out of print or no longer available for some reason. But are games that I feel like discussing at length because of their significance to me or their significance to gaming in general. So what this video is, is a detailed look at the legacy of Arkham Horror. From its original version back in 1987 all the way through to the latest edition. And as part of the series I want to talk to the designers involved with the games, their thought processes behind them and how they think the legacy of the game is held up. So to this end, I reached out to Richard Launius, designer of 1st edition, Kevin Wilson, designer of 2nd edition, and Nikki Valens, designer of 3rd edition, and got their comments for this video. So sit back and enjoy the ride. When most people think of Arkham Horror, they think of the 2005 edition. In fact, I recall a lot of people being surprised that the new Arkham Horror was 3rd edition, because they assumed that 2005 was the 1st edition, but it wasn't. The 1st edition came out in 1987, and it was one of the very first cooperative board games. That alone makes it a significant game in the history of board gaming. So let's take a look at the original board, and you'll see that the town isn't actually that different. Fundamentally, there's still the same areas that you could go to in this game, that you could in 2nd edition or even 3rd edition. The Curiosity Shop, Hibbs Roadhouse, all of those locations that are now so familiar. But also above the board are the Outer World locations, uh, which was kept for 2nd edition and changed for 3rd. The Doom Track is there and that gets carried across into 2nd edition as well. But one of the big differences in this game is there wasn't encounter cards. There were rolled encounters for each location. So across the top of the board you'll see the encounters for the different other worlds. And on this page you'll see some of the encounters for the other locations that you'd roll 2d6 on. And then we'll cut to the characters, and you'll see that they've got health and sanity, they've got skills, and a lot of these characters are still popping up in the Arkham Files, and that's something I really quite like. I believe Jenny Barnes in particular has been in every iteration of the game, and all of the Arkham Files games. And most of the others have been in almost all of them. Now my personal experience with the original Arkham Horror is kind of limited. A friend of mine had it, or I saw it at a convention way back in the, in the early 90s. And I don't actually know if I played it. I don't think I did. I think I took it apart, had a look at it, read the rules, and played around with it a bit, but I don't think I actually sat down and played a full game of it. So most of what I know about the game is from hearsay, or from reading other people's accounts of the game. But that doesn't mean it hasn't had an impact on me, because without this game, there is no 2nd edition, there is no 3rd edition, and there's probably no Mansions of Madness or any of the others. I asked Richard Launius what his driving force to make the original Arkham Horror game was, and what was his overall vision for the game. Here's his response. We had just moved to Rochester, New York, and we had two small children and my wife working evening shift, and I was working day shift and taking care of the children at night. Having played the Call of Cthulhu RPG, I decided to spend my time after the kids went to bed designing a board game in the Lovecraft universe that could be played solitaire or cooperative. Out of that idea came Arkham Horror. The original vision for the game was more pulp than mythos, but with the investigators running around town, fighting monsters, having encounters, and jumping through gates. My focus was on story and adventurous fun, and what was ultimately created and published far exceeded my initial vision. I also asked Richard if he could go back in time and change one thing, what would it be? And his reply was, There are many things that could have been changed in the original game, but I think the single thing I would have added would have been the addition of a single unique skill for each investigator. I added this in the revision, and Kevin Wilson took them even further. But just a unique skill associated to an investigator's profession would have been a really nice thematic bonus in the original game. So was Arkham Horror before its time? Was the world not quite ready for cooperative gaming at this point? It's probably true, like, cooperative gaming just wasn't a thing in the 80s, it wasn't a thing in the 90s, it really wasn't a thing until the 2000s. The interesting thing about this game is it wasn't a massive hit. It did quite solidly, but it wasn't one of those games that was an evergreen, it was in stores constantly for decades and decades. It wasn't a Settlers of Catan is what I'm trying to say. And while Richard never really abandoned the project, it did sit 18 years between different editions. Now, 18 years between editions of a game is a hell of a long time. But Richard had been thinking about what to do, and Fantasy Flight Games were interested in making a new edition. And that would become the edition that I'm most familiar with, 2nd edition. I 
I asked Richard what inputs he's had to later editions, and he said, I had already redesigned the game from the first edition, so I'd already addressed additional skills, adding an ancient one to battle at the end of the game, and many other small things. But what was fortunate was that Kevin shared many of his ideas with me and included me in the second edition development. The same is true of many of the expansions, and Corey had also come to me to play both Eldritch Horror and Arkham Horror 3rd edition when they were in the early design stages. I have also been able to playtest many of the beta editions and provide feedback. I think every now and then I have provided something of value, but the simple truth is that the folks that work for Fantasy Flight Games are brilliant designers and do a great job. It has certainly been my pleasure to work with Kevin, Corey, and Nikki to whatever level possible to make great games in the Arkham Horror line. I find this really fascinating that Richard stayed involved in the line, not necessarily as a designer, but as a contributor, as a consultant, as a tester. It's like being the elder statesman of the Arkham Files. And it pleases me that he's been kept in the loop and kept involved. I think that's really nice of the designers and the companies involved to keep Richard involved, get his insights, and get his input into what would become the Arkham File games. Now, picking up the designer hat for second edition was Kevin Wilson. Now, Kevin was one of the designers in Fantasy Flight games when the company really took off. And some of his designs from that period are classics that have really shaped how Fantasy Flight games has gone. Kevin since left Fantasy Flight games and is living the life of a freelance designer. I reached out to Kevin and asked him what he thought when he found out he would be redesigning Arkham Horror and what went through his mind at the time. And he replied, I was pretty pleased about it. I'd run into Richard at Origins and given him my business card after playing his Return to Arkham oversized prototype there. It seemed like a pretty good fit for Fantasy Flight games since we were already doing the Call of Cthulhu CCG then. I also asked him what his overall vision for 2nd edition was. Kevin said, Mostly my thoughts were how to modernize some of the mechanics and how to build more replayability into the game. Rich and I also had thought to use the Great Old Ones as game modifiers so that a game against Cthulhu was different from a game against Neralia Hothep. I also asked him what single change to the second edition was he most proud of, and he replied, Probably the change to the Great Old Ones. Previously they were just in the Monster Cup, but in second edition they were a much bigger deal and we got a ton of mileage out of having them affect the whole game. I also asked him if he could call himself from 2005 and suggest one change of the game, what would it be? He replied, I would probably suggest a change to spells. They were never quite as useful as I would have liked, since the sanity cost was ultimately so high. And to reply to Kevin, that's why my partner's favourite character is Daisy, because she pays less for spells. Stephanie absolutely loves Daisy. I also asked Richard what he thought was the best single change to the second edition. And he replied, In the second edition it would be the addition of the Ancient One that has a slumber effect during play, and then maybe battled at the end. And it's interesting that the two of them are quite lined up here. But that brings us to what happened with 2nd Edition. And it blew up. It became a really big, popular game, a huge seller, and brought co-op games to the foreground. There are 44,000 copies registered on Board Game Geek at the moment, and we know that's just a small section of the actual number of copies in existence. They ended up publishing 8 expansions for this game, which is massive. The game has to be selling consistently for a very long time, to get eight reasonable size expansions. Four of those were big box expansions too. And at this time I'd like to have a shout out to Tibbs who ran something called Arkham Stats where people could log and record games. And he tracked well over 10,000 games of Arkham Horror with the investigators, who they were fighting, how it was won, all that data. And that's all available online. So if you ever want to pick up your game and go, we want a challenge, let's, let's take the hardest uh, great old ones and let's try to win it the hardest way possible. You can actually jump on there have a good look around at the data, and pick out those insights to shape the game the way you want it to be. Now my personal story of Arkham Horror is quite interesting, and um, well quite personal, because 2005 when Arkham Horror came out was about the same time I got very very sick. So I had something called pericarditis and myocarditis, and that's a virus that attacks the heart. And I was unable to work for about 18 months, and I had flu-like symptoms, and had to bounce in and out of hospital. I was living alone in a boarding house arrangement where I basically had a room that was big enough to have a table in it and a bed, and no internet or anything like that. Arkham Arkham Horror was the only soloable board game I had at that time. I, le I left it semi-permanently set up on my table for that 18 month period. And sometimes I would play two to three games a day um, because I couldn't leave the house and I couldn't really do much else. So getting up from bed, pottering over to the table and playing a solo board game for a while to occupy my mind was one of the few things I could do. So if anyone says the game's got no replayability, you can have a fight with me about that. 
Now, Arkham Horror hasn't been everyone's cup of tea. A lot of people have derided it for being too complex, too fiddly, taking too long to play, and I can understand some of those arguments. I have played it with people who have taken an exceptionally long time to play it. Also, playing with eight people does sound like torture to me. I think the ideal amount is four to five characters. And not four to five players, but four to five characters. So here we have Arkham Horror. Selling like gangbusters, reaches a natural conclusion of its life cycle with the Miskatonic Horror expansion, which is one of my favorite expansions ever published for any game, because it doesn't really introduce any new ideas, any new concepts. It's just more stuff for all the previous expansions. And it's a great way to cap off a game and say, this game is done, this is complete, this is how it's going to be from now on. And that's one of those interesting things about board games is that people think when an ex expansion stopped getting published that somehow the game's dead. Arkham Horror is still alive. If you've got a copy of it, you can still play it. Yeah, it's harder to get these days, but there's no reason you can't play it. Anyway, the success of Arkham Horror led to the creation of the Arkham Files. Now this video is about Arkham Horror primarily, so we're not going to dwell on these too long, just sort of talk about them briefly. But you had the original Mansions of Madness, which was a dungeon crawler type game with someone playing a dungeon master type character with these expansive scenarios. Now, I loved playing Mansions of Madness, but I hated setting up Mansions of Madness. But it's still a wonderful game, I've still got my copy of it, we haven't played it in quite a while, but the big problem is when you're the keeper, you have to set up all the cards and decide how different paths would go and that can take an awful lot of time there's also elder sign which is the lightest of the games in the arkham files basically cthulhu yahtzee with some character stuff built into it i've played elder sign to death on the app so it's not a game i own anymore but it's a game i have played north of 200 times just because a game of elder sign was the exact length of my bus trip into town for work it's probably still the best launch point into the Arkham Files games for someone coming from the outside who hasn't played games before because the dice manipulation system is really intuitive and very easy to understand for anyone who's played games like Yahtzee. Then we have Eldritch Horror which occupies a fascinating place as like an Arkham Horror 2.5 edition or an Arkham Horror 3rd edition world edition. It's a curious one to place because in a lot of ways it is a new edition of Arkham Horror but in some ways it isn't because it's not set in Arkham. But the fundamentals that make Arkham Horror what it is are still in Eldritch Horror, so it's it's like a side game. Eldritch Horror was also a stunning success, possibly more so than Arkham Horror 2005. Many people embrace the streamlining within the game, and I believe this game's also come to the natural end of its life cycle, with a whole bunch of expansions being published. So Eldritch Horror is now, for all intents and purposes, a complete game. And if you own all of it, awesome, you'll be able to play that Till the end of time then we have the arkham horror lcg which was an exceptionally ambitious game design idea a cooperative story driven collectible card game and just saying what it is sort of gives you an idea of how much work would have had to go into this thing and i tell you what it's a great game like we've only played the first two campaigns but they were fantastic uh, i've fallen behind buying the expansion packs because they're quite hard to get in new zealand for a reasonable price but I'm looking to source from overseas the big box expansion and the next six packs so we can do like a whole campaign at one time. I kind of wish they sold it in a big box instead of the way they do it with the distribution model with the six expansion packs. It's just a pain to get hold of them. And you forget which one you've got and you have to order it. It's just annoying. But playing it at the table, it is the closest thing I've played to a real RPG still using a board game system. Uh, we really got into our characters when we were playing this game, and it was top-notch fun. And finally, Mansions of Man 2nd Edition, which for me is a high bar on how you can take a pretty good game, streamline it, and make it an exceptional game. I really like Mansions of Man 2nd Edition. I love how the app integration works. The removal of the Keeper, which was my single biggest problem with the game, was the setup. Boom, that's done. You can just pick up the app, set things up, and start rolling. I think Nicky Valens did exceptional work with Mansions of Madness 2nd Edition. And for me, it's one of the best 2nd Editions I've ever played, right up there with Arkham Horror 2nd Edition, funnily enough. So with that stunning success under a belt, it made perfect sense that they picked Nicky to lead the design of Arkham Horror 3rd Edition.
So I asked Nikki, looking back at the moment you first found out you'd be redesigning Arkham Horror, what went through your mind and what were you feeling? She replied, Eldritch Horror was the first project I worked on with Fantasy Flight Games. When they told me what I would be working on, on my very first day, I was pretty shocked. I knew Eldritch would be a successor to Arkham in many ways, and I knew of Arkham's popularity. I was surprised but happy they trusted a brand new employee with such an important project. And as far as first projects go, I think I did a pretty good job with it. And after working on Eldritch and its expansions for a couple of years, and also leading the design for Mansions of Madness, I had a feeling I would be the person to design Arkham Horror 3rd Edition, if the company ever decided to do it. So when I was asked, I already had some idea of what I wanted to focus on with the new edition. I then asked Nikki what her overall vision for the 3rd edition was. She replied, The most important goal was to capture what players loved about 2nd edition. Research indicated that the atmosphere and character stories were the most important aspects to the majority of players. So that's where I focused most of my energy. Other goals of course included making the game more accessible than the previous editions, and to bring some new life and modern design mentality to the project. I also asked her, from a game design perspective, what single change to the 3rd edition are you most proud of? She replied, rather than a single big change, it is the many small changes that were all made with the same goal in mind, accessibility. I was able to reduce rules overhead and player busy work considerably in a number of different areas of the game without losing mechanical depth. Things like skill sliders, monster movement, combat and other world exploration had deep and complex systems in 2nd edition. I feel I was able to capture the goals of those systems in simpler ways that frees the players to enjoy the game more instead of feeling that they're repeatedly needing to check the rules or move tokens around. Arkham Horror 3rd edition has been polarizing it seems. I think it's probably better for new players and people who haven't played 2nd edition to get into it. I definitely think it's more accessible and friendlier to a new crowd. But conversely, it's also very different for someone from a 2nd edition background. And those people who really love 2nd edition could find 3rd edition quite a different experience. My defense of that is that there was no point 3rd edition just being 2nd edition. We already have 2nd edition. We have 2nd edition and 8 expansions. That game didn't need to exist. So what Nikki did with creating 3rd edition was create a game that needed to exist. And perhaps it's unfair to judge a game with just a core box against a game with 8 expansions. Well, at least we know expansions are coming, according to my sources. Who, by the way, are not the designers interviewed here, in case anyone's wondering. But Fantasy Flight Games are working on expansions for this game right now. However, the focus of this video was on Arkham Horror 2nd Edition. So let's dig into that game in the form of a long, laborious unboxing video. So this is how I store Arkham Horror, in three big boxes and one small box that I keep separate, which I'll explain why later. Everything from Arkham Horror is packed away in these boxes. So let's crack them open one at a time and have a look what's inside each one. So the first thing in the box of course is the main board and we'll set that up. And you might notice that this board is a bit darker than some versions you may have seen, and that's because it's one of the first printings. And they changed the brightness on the board and redesigned it slightly for later print runs. Underneath the board in the box are these two small boxes, which I'll get into later, and all of these cards. Now, you need some good hand strength to pick up all these cards at once. This is all of the core Mythos, Encounter, Otherworld, and Final Battle cards in one spot. And here they are, the Otherworld Encounter cards. One of the things I really liked about the Otherworld Encounter cards was the scaling difficulty. So you had red, yellow, blue, green in terms of the average difficulty of the encounters. So you knew if you were going to Rillia, which was a place where you could only draw red and yellow cards, it was going to be a lot harder than, say, Celiano, which was only blue or green cards. And then there's the giant pile of core Mythos cards. Now these are the Mythos cards from the core game and the Miskatonic Horror ones as well. So Mythos cards I would use in every game. And Mythos cards break down into three main groups. Headlines, which are sort of one-off effects. Rumors, which are ongoing horrible nasty things you really have to deal with and environments which change the game and then there's a nine encounter decks for the nine core locations here is just the core games encounters uh 
I'll talk about how I add expansions in later. One of the clever things about these cards is that each card has three different encounters on it, one for each location in that neighborhood. And just that idea of reduce the number of cards you would have in the game by a third. I think it's a really clever design idea. It also allowed them to do things like create the Inner Sanctum, which is a special location you can only go to if you're in the Silver Twilight Lodge and have a Silver Twilight Lodge membership. And finally, tucked away in that box are the gate markers, each leading to a different other world, which leaves us with these two boxes I'll cover later. And this is the inside of the second box. And you'll see another small box in there. This one has all of the character cards and the great old ones in it, as well as the items, skills, and allies decks, and all of the various rule books and rules pamphlets that have come with all of the expansions. Yeah, there's a lot of them. And finally, at the bottom of the box are the three expansion boards, which of course is the Dunwich Horror board, the Kingsport board, and the Innsmouth board. So let's look at some of the stuff in this box. We've got the common item deck. Some of my favorite things in this are like the elephant gun, which was a super powered gun that you had to pay money to reload. Uh, the press pass, which was exceptionally powerful and gave you an extra clue when you got clues. The athame, which was a weapon that got better against people with magic immunity and magic resistance. And of course, the shotgun, which would be the most traded item during an ancient one battle, as you just load up the shotgun, load up with clues, and spend all your clues as though they were shotgun shells. Then there's the unique items, which are similar in some ways to the common items, but usually more powerful or more interesting. The most famous of which is the Elder Sign, which is a powerful item that allowed you to seal a gate. My favorite items in this deck are the Massa de Requiem Peshage, which allows you to bring on the end game early. So you pass a check and you summon the Ancient One straight away, which sometimes can be an exceptionally good strategy. The Gate Box, which allows you to return to Arkham from any other world. So you could jump into a safe place like Saliano and pop out and close the gate to Rillia. And finally, joining the winning team, which I've never managed to pull off. Because it requires you to sacrifice four allies at these four locations. In which case, the game stops being a cooperative game and becomes a traitor game. Where you are the only winner. I've never seen anyone pull this off in any game I've played. The mission itself comes up very infrequently and it's really difficult to achieve. But I love that it's in the game. Then we have spells which fall into three main categories which are defensive, offensive and utility. My favorite spells are Find Gate which is one that allows you to skip a turn in the Outer Worlds and come back earlier which dramatically improves your chances of winning by either closing or sealing gates. Storm of Spirits which is a zero sanity cost spell which allows people with high law to use their law instead of fight. Really good spell. And Alchemical Process, which is just a way to print money, especially for Daisy, as she doesn't have to pay the one sanity cost. Then there's a plethora of skills. In the core game, the skills were like plus one speed, plus one will, but as the game expanded, they got more varied and more interesting. And then there are the Kaleidoscope of Available Allies. So they recommend only playing with 11 allies, but what we tended to do was play with all of them, but when the Terra asks you to discard an ally, we discarded two or three, depending on how many allies were left. So that if the Terra track got to 10, most of the allies would be out of the deck. But we just liked having them all in there. And finally, the small cards, we've got the personal stories, which were introduced quite late in the piece, but were a really neat part of the game and something we always play with now. So each character had a pass or fail objective. And if they passed, they would get a substantive benefit. And if they failed, something terrible would happen. Just one of those little additions that just adds a bit to the game. Then we have the Great Old Ones. And boy, are there an awful lot of Great Old Ones in this game. Here's probably the four easiest from the core set. Azathoth, for example, takes a long time to awaken with a Doom Track of 14. But if he awakens, you're all dead. And Yig, who, honestly, there's no point closing gates, just shoot him in the face. And then we had the four hard ones from the original set. Including, of course, the iconic Cthulhu, who was very much the hardest old one in the first set. But as you are to find out as we go through, the old ones got harder and harder as the game went on. This is the first expansion's old ones, and Shunmael became my go-to one for teaching new players how to play. Because its difficulty wasn't that high, but the effect of creating earthquakes was really neat and evocative. Abhoth, Sothogua, and Glucky are all towards the higher end of difficulty compared to the core game's great old ones as well. Then the next expansion got real tricky. Athaknaka is really difficult. Completely changes how you play the game. A lot of the game you focus on closing and sealing gates, 
Ahaknaka doesn't care about sealed gates. They'll just burst through. And I really liked how Ihort works. Every time you close a gate and do other things, you end up getting these little brood tokens on you. And if you get too many brood tokens, you'll explode and die. And yep, still requires a heck of a lot of difficult management as you can only carry five clue tokens, which is the exact number you need to seal a gate. So you have to make it all the way through the outer world to the end of the gate without spending clues. If you want to spend clues to seal a gate. Then we got eight great old ones in the Innsmouth expansion, including Quachot Otos, who has a unique dust deck, which you slowly burn through during the game and gets progressively nastier and nastier until he's pretty much just pointing a finger at people and destroying them. And then on to the final four here, including Zar, who is exceptionally tough because there's a good chance he spawns two gates each turn. Ran Tegoth, who's just going to awaken really early and he's very, very hard to fight. And Nyokla, who has a cool thing with his tentacles popping up and attacking people. And then we have the massive selection of characters from these games. I'm not going to talk about each of these characters because there's 48 of them. But what I will say is there's very few characters I don't enjoy playing in this game. And some I really, really like. Uh, like Diana Stanley, the Redeemed Cultist. One of my favorite characters just because of her background and the fact that she starts with a Silver Twilight membership. Then there's Daisy Walker, who is my partner's absolute favorite character. And if we're picking characters, she will always pick Daisy. Regardless of what game it is, it doesn't matter if it's Arkham Horror 2nd, Mansions, you name it. If Daisy's in it, she'll play it. And Rex Murphy, a character who starts cursed and can't get rid of curses. So at the start of the game, he has to roll sixes when everyone else is rolling fives. But he's exceptionally powerful once you get his curse off him. Then we have interesting characters that came out later in the game, like Trish Scarborough, who broke the focus rules and used focus completely differently. And finally, Patrice Hathaway, who is without a doubt the most broken character in this game. If you've played Arkham Horror 2nd Edition enough, you'll know why Patrice is pretty broken. And if you haven't played Arkham Horror 2nd Edition, just know that she is exceptionally useful. Her special ability of being able to allow people to spend clues off her is just papers over the cracks in so many issues you'll have in the game. Next we come to the four small boxes that are full of a bunch of different pieces. This one is where I keep all the character figures, which is why I keep it separate, because we use the same figures for Mansions of Madness, for the Arkham Horror LCG, and for any other Arkham Files games we're playing. I actually went out and purchased all of the individual Arkham Investigator figures when they were available, and what I've been doing is, as Mansions of Madness brings out new characters, I've been swapping out the old ones and painting up new ones. So this photo has a mixture of my painted characters, as well as the older characters from the Arkham Investigators line. The second box contains all of the core stuff you need for every game. So that's bags with clue tokens, health, sanity, money, sliders, all that stuff that gets distributed at the start of the game. And of course in that box are the sliders, which are one of the things that's been maligned by this game, but it's actually one of my favorite parts of it. So if you don't know how sliders work, you place them around your skill pairs like this. So in this case, this character would have one law and four luck. And you have a focus stat, which at the start of the turn, you're allowed to move these sliders that many spaces left or right. So what it means is if this character's picked up a tome and wants to read it, and that requires a law check, they can spend their focus and shift their law two spaces to the right. That gives them three law this turn. And for me, that's a level of control and preparation and planning that I actually really enjoyed in this game. This box also contains the player guides, which uh, just remind you of some core factors that change based on the player count. And also on this box are the heralds, which are modifiers you can play to a game. You can add the Dark Pharaoh as an extra sort of pre-Great Old One to supplement the old ones. And there are also institutions and guides who can make the game easier to play. So you can mix and match these to make the game slightly different each time you play. Then this box has all of the status markers and stuff in it. So if we open this one up, you'll see inside that things like the blessing tokens, the retainers, the injury cards. I don't actually set these up at the start of the game. I just keep them in their baggies until they're needed. When someone gets a blessing, I'll just reach in, grab the blessing bag and chuck it to them. If no one gets a retainer all game, there's no point having the retainer cards set up there. So they just stay in that box until they're needed. And then the lurker at the threshold box. Now this box doesn't need to be open most of the time because it contains all of the tokens for the individual old ones, heralds, and other things that, that only appear in certain games. So in one bag you've got the mask monsters, and in other ones you've got Ihort's brood tokens, 
And another one, you've got the tokens for Bast. Again, there's no point setting this stuff up if you're not using it in the particular game you're playing. So that's why they stay in that small box. And then finally, the big box which has all of the expansion stuff in it. So each of these bags has all the Mythos cards and counter cards and special cards from each of the expansions. So for example, if we crack open the Dark Pharaoh, you can see all the cards here. And the reason I keep the expansion stuff separate like this will be explained in the next chapter. Also in this bag are the neat little gate holders I've got for the game, as well as my Elder Sign tokens I got. These don't come with the game, this is optional extras, but you know, they're cool anyway. And finally, the Monster Cup. Now, I actually got this for a Monster Cup. It's a, a cheap Egyptian style vase, but it's really cool. And here are all the monsters from all of the games chucked into that one cup. So now that I've shown you what's in the game and how I store it, let's talk about how I enjoy the game. And the way that is, is we set up the core board and we only play with one expansion at a time. So we use the item cards, unique items and spells from all the expansions and the characters, but we only use the encounters mythos cards from one expansion at a time. So we take the core encounter decks and we shuffle in the encounter cards from that one particular expansion. And we also set up two piles of mythos cards, one for the expansion and one for the core. And what I do is we draw alternating cards from the different piles and I use a subtle marker like the Cthulhu Wars Cthulhu to remind me what pile I'm supposed to draw from next. And the reason for keeping the expansion so separate and for using this method, which was introducing the Dark Pharaoh as the traveling exhibit model, is that I found if you put all the expansions together, the story just gets diluted. Uh, Dunwich might not have a gate open in a full game if you're playing with all of the expansions put in. But if you're playing with the Dunwich Horror and just the core, then that flavor of the Dunwich expansion really comes out. Same applies for all of the expansions. And it just makes it more thematic and also a lot less to manage. If you're only worrying about one expansion's extra mechanics, it's a lot easier to keep in your head. It means you don't have to have all nine of the rule sheets available at any given time. So the main way we end up playing this game is either solo with three to four characters or with my partner Stephanie uh, with us playing two characters each. And I also enjoy playing it with my established group of friends, which is a group of five, and we play a total of five characters. And I think those player counts are about my favorite. So one person with three to four characters, two people with four characters, or four and five people playing characters. We also always play with the final battle rules, which make for a harder final battle with the great old one, but a more interesting one. So that's always something we add in. I asked each of the three designers that if they were to sit down to play any of the Arkham games, what four investigators would they pick and which great old one would they choose to face down? Richard responded, Joe Diamond, Jenny Barnes, Sister Mary, and Harvey Walters. I am very old school, actually very old now that I think about it, and I love the story these characters create in each game. And for an ancient one, you cannot do better than Cthulhu, although I like a lot of variety here when I play. Kevin Wilson responded, I like playing Wilson Richards the handyman, or Ashcan Pete myself. I also think it's nice to have Kate Winthrop the scientist in the game. Beyond that, surprise me on the investigators, and honestly I like to play random investigators anyway. So here we go, Kevin. I'm going to surprise you with an addition to your team of Kevin Wilson, the board game designer. And for a great old one, Kevin picked Gata Natoa, or alternatively, Neralia Hothep. And Nikki's take was, many who follow me on Twitter know that my favorite investigator is Wendy Adams. To back her up, I think I'd pick Danielle Reyes, Lily Chen, and Agatha Crane. Those four badass ladies can get the job done, and done right even against omnipotent beings like Yog sothoth And if my life was on the line and I needed a team to win this game at any cost, I would pick I would pick Daisy Walker because Stephanie would play with me then, but she's also the best spellcaster in the game and can give you a lot of utility. Mandy Thompson is a good all-rounder who's good at closing gates and her special ability is a lifesaver frequently. Hank Sampson's probably the best street sweeper for keeping monsters off the streets because if he beats them, he doesn't take any sanity loss. And Patrice, as mentioned, just papers up all the cracks in your team. And if I'm going to choose an old one to take on to really challenge myself, it'll be Zar. Zar's awful. So what is the legacy of Arkham Horror? Cooperative gaming is now a thing. Now, is that Arkham Horror responsible? 
Is Pandemic responsible? Are they both responsible? Probably. But Arkham Horror was very much a trailblazer in that cooperative gaming space. It was definitely the game that got me into cooperative gaming. I asked the three designers what they thought about the legacy of Arkham Horror. Richard replied, I think Arkham Horror was groundbreaking as a cooperative game and possibly even more valuable in making the story of the game more important than winning or losing. I seldom attend a convention when someone doesn't come up and share a story from one of their Arkham Horror games, describing it as someone might describe an event in a movie or from a novel. Sometimes the event occurred more than 10 years ago and they still have a vivid memory of it. That is special. Kevin replied, I think Arkham Horror was a significant part of the rising popularity of cooperative games which is appropriate since first edition was one of, if not the earliest co-op. And that's a great thing since I love to play co-ops. For me, I don't always want to play against my friends, so co-ops make a really nice change of pace. And Nikki replied, In many ways, they opened the gates for cooperative games. They pushed in new directions in terms of both storytelling and player choices and helped to define what co-op players expect from games today. And I think I agree with all of them here. What made Arkham Horror special and its legacy it's not that it's a cooperative puzzle or just a cooperative game, but it's a cooperative game that creates moments, it creates stories, it creates experiences and anecdotes that you can share for years and years. Little ones of mine are the time that a friend of mine, Thomas, was playing and he kept being clues spawning down at the woods. So he kept going to the woods and every time he went into the woods, the Sheldon gang beat him up every single time. Five times he went to the woods in that game and got beaten up by the Sheldon gang and got a clue at the same time. And then he would go to the hospital, heal up, and come back the next turn. Until finally, on the sixth turn, they offered him a membership to the gang. Clearly this old guy's not going away, so... Welcome to the team, partner! And that's one story from dozens, hundreds, loads of anecdotes I have about this game. From the moments I created with my friends, the moments I created with my partner, and even the moments when I was playing solo, although those are slightly less interesting to share. And that brings us to the designer's reflections on the games. I asked them what was their fondest memory of the game, whether it was in development, the fan interaction, playtesting, or anything else. Nikki replied, At Arkham Knights in 2015, we ran a 16-player Eldritch Horror event called Cycle of Eternity. We printed off a huge oversized board over 50 inches long and got 16 players all working together to save the world. It was great seeing everyone working together and discussing their strategies. We read their encounters and the mythos events aloud for all to hear, adding our own dramatic flourishes. It was a really spectacular event that I know they all enjoyed and at the end someone got to go home with a huge game board. Kevin replied, I think my fondest memories of the game are the long meetings that Richard and I had where we hashed out a ton of details and came up with dozens of ideas for how to make the game a reality. We met several times at Origins and had long lunch meetings. That's where we first came up with the Great Old Ones mechanic and when we planned out the various city expansions and how the boards would all link together through the train station. Very early on, I had a list of cities we might visit. Dunwich, Kingsport and Innsmouth. And Richard replied, it's hard to whittle it down to one thing, as I have enjoyed all of it. Working with great designers at FFG, running demos at Dice Tower Con, and various other conventions, and every moment of designing the game, and hand-painting the original Arkham Horror boards, and creating characters. It has been a true joy in my life on so many levels. I guess my overall fondest memory of the game has to be attending the Arkham Knights events, and watching the crowd of people playing all the various Arkham Horror Files games and the fun they were having. I experience this to a lesser degree at conventions when I run the game, but Arkham Knights is special as it is two days of all things Arkham by people that love the universe and one or more games in it. And what of the future of the Arkham Files? Where do we go from here? As I mentioned, Arkham Horror 3rd Edition is getting expansions and may go through a long cycle of expansions as well. But what about an Arkham Horror 4th Edition some decade from now? To finish off, I asked Nikki Valens what advice she would give to a potential designer of 4th edition. And she replied, To follow your heart and listen to the players, but remember that you can't please everyone. I know the work I did with 3rd edition is admired by many and hated by others. Ultimately, 2nd and 3rd editions remain different games with the same design goals but different executions. A future 4th edition would likewise be both unique and similar to the editions that came before it. Thank you for taking the time to listen to this, and I'd like to thank Richard Launius, Kevin Wilson and Nikki Valens for taking the time to respond to my queries. Hearing their insight into the game has been really important to me and it's quite humbling that as busy people they took the time to talk to me about this. Uh, it's one of the great things about board games is 
the community aspect and that people are approachable when you ask, hey, you want to fill out this questionnaire for me? So thank you, all of you. Um, I really appreciated it. And this video is made possible by Patreon. Here's a list of our backers for the channel at the moment. So if you want to get involved in the channel and, and help me decide where we're going and what we're going to cover, uh, just sign up on Patreon. Even a dollar a month allows you access to our polls which determine what videos get made. Thank you for taking the time to listen to this video. Hare mai. And if you enjoyed this video, like it, subscribe to the channel, and check out our Patreon.